Fun. The time is now. I mean, he is the voice of your favorite anime character. Come on now, make some noise for Mr. Chris Savage. Testicles, one, two, four. Turn up green, I need more green. Oh, there you go. Hey, there's What's green on the microphone happening? right here. Hi guys, how you doing? Yes, yes. Do you know this reminds me a little bit, uh, back in the days when, how many of you like kind of have been going to just anime conventions for a million years? Like well, my anime, anime head tag. Any, yeah, right. any of you been going to like Ohio Con and stuff yeah. like that? Yeah. Right. The, this, this panel here, would have actually just been closing ceremonies. I don't know if you guys remember closing wow, yes, ceremonies. Yes. I don't know if they still do those in pop culture concerts. But I know what you're talking. About. But those those were actually they were fun. I'm sure for some people, they were also the worst for us. It's just like, oh my gosh, I have to go to closing ceremonies. I'm so <laughs> tired, and I have to be like so on. For but I am. Uh, I only showed up yesterday evening. I crashed the uh, My Hero Academia hey! panel. A welcome surprise, a welcome surprise. That was one of my favorite panels I've ever been on. I just love those people so much. Yeah. It's like, I I would adopt everyone on that stage. So. You're not that old, Chris. I know, I know but I would still old. adopt them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so jumping right into this conversation, I mean, literally, when, when I was playfully describing you as Mr. Anime, that's not untrue. Like, there are so many things that have used your voice that we know and love, how do you feel about that legacy of being a part of this culture and being such a forefront pioneer in it? The, I guess that's a good question, actually. It's, it's kind of like I landed on this planet yeah. called anime or something in the United States, and there weren't that many people there. Right? And I just sort of wandered around and I like, I. I found all the really cool things that were left on the ground at the time, you know, I'm like, oh, check this out, this is uh, a, oh, a Vegeta, what is <laughs> Piccolo, what is this, uh, what are people, like, uh, do people watch the show? I don't know, Let's like, I don't know, like, uh, oh, Zoro, oh, he's a pirate, that sounds right. fun, he looks like a swordsman, um, I don't know why they call him Marines, uh, why they call him, like, Marines when they're clearly the army, but whatever, um, or vice versa, right, right, um, right. the, but yeah, I just kind of sat there as anime kind of formed itself around me, and look at it now. It's yeah, so big. Yes. It's so big. That's the see. That's the thing. Like where okay, so you and I are of a similar age. Um, we actually have a similar birthday. You are your birthday is ten days after mine. So okay, so you're the twelfth. I'm the twelfth. So nice. we're April babies. Um, but you're technically a Taurus versus yeah, I'm a first decade of Taurus. I got you. Right. It's all good. But we still love you, though. We still love you. <laughs> but no. Um, to, to have remembered when anime was this thing that you only heard about in kind of back room corners and stuff and to see how it's grown, for you to have seen the, the, the placement of this for your career, to kind of plant a flag and go, this is where I need to be. There's so many different things that your voice would be phenomenal for, but to kind of plant the flag here and kind of see where this was going, where did that come from for you? Almost as like a business sense or intuitive nature of this thing. I mean. It was not, well, okay, it clearly has been now. Sure. But at the time, it certainly wasn't a great business decision okay. to work at Funimation back in 1998, 99. I mean, I, they literally had me on staff working for like $20,000 a year. Like wow. they, they had no money. And those of us who kind of worked on, that sh on all these shows yeah. for all these years, we did it because we enjoyed it. It wasn't because we were going to conventions or making any money doing it. It was just, we liked it and it was cool to do. Uh, it, but back then, of course, you had to explain to everybody what anime what? even was. Right. You know, back in those days, even when people who were watching Dragon Ball had to explain it to their parents. And now I have parents that have named their kid right. Gohan <laughs> that have been watching it for 20 years, you exactly. know. Uh, they, they have no choice, and so there's, I love that the like, people who are in their 20s mm -hmm. are getting autographs for their for their dad and, awesome. and who introduced them, and I think it's awesome that anime's had this complete um, generation loop. And since, I'm sorry I'm rambling, but like yesterday on our panel I had this thought, um, for the longest time, especially when I first started, 
anime voice acting, anime dubbing, was considered literally the lowest rung <laughs> on the acting totem pole. Like, it was just the absolute lowest. Like, you... You didn't do that. It, it was like one of those things, like, if you come from an embarrassing town name that's close to a larger town, you would say, you don't say I'm from League City, Texas. I say, you know, I'm from uh, Houston. Yep, yep. Uh, but anime was kind of that thing at the start because it just, people thought like, oh, especially because the anime dubs right when they first started were done by people who didn't know anything about anime right. at all. And it was including Funimation, I think, back in the earliest days. And we, uh, and it wasn't, I mean, there wasn't a lot of money in it. There weren't a lot of real actors in it per se. Uh, but I always loved, I've always liked being a voice actor in anime. And I've tried to explain this on panels for the longest time. Like, I've been in video games, I've done prelay uh, on other, like, cartoons. But I love anime so much. And it's not even because of just the genre, but sure. there's just the technical nature of how anime is recorded. Um, and I was reminded of this because I, I was watching a behind the scenes video uh, featurette for this series called 1899. It just came out on Netflix. Yes, yes, yes. It's really good by a German director who did a series called Dark. And they were talking about the technology they used on the set because they filmed the whole thing during COVID. And uh, apparently used, they've used the same technology for like the Mandalorian. And it's called, it's this technology called the volume. Yes. And it's this 260 degree high def rear projected screen. Yep. All LED style. Total LED screen. All the actors are on a set and the set can actually revolve too. So they can get, and the actors say that it is amazing yeah. because when you're standing there, every, like they have to do a bunch of pre-production. So it's, it's basically like instead of green screen, you just imagine like anywhere there was a green screen, it's just the scene. Right. Like you can see it like clearly if you're in a mountainscape, if you're in a landscape, you see all of it, and it just feels really real. And I was thinking, that's why I love anime so much, because when I come in to do a voice on something, the music's already there, right? the sound effects is already, it's complete, the yeah, show's yeah. done. There's no question about like what it's going to look like eventually, right. you know what it's gonna look like there, and that's what's fun for me. That's amazing. You get to like, as much as you love, you guys love to watch these shows, it's fun to just be able to play in that world and just, record with if you're if you're one of the later people to record you get all the other actors in your group right. too and it's the coolest thing so i'm very very proud and very happy to be working in in anime these days especially when i have people from so many other type of genres coming over and going like i don't know what you're feeding these people that are in their line but i want some of those drugs or whatever you're giving to them uh since you beats for everybody i've had people that you guys would be surprised at coming to me going like how can I get into this anime racket? You know what I mean? Like people like- First of all, don't call it that. Like, don't <laughs> start with that. But still, they, there's people who are desperately wanting to get into anime now, other performers, because they realize that the the fandom for the show is so Huge. great. Like these shows are so great and they're so dedicated. Um, and I, there's so many people that work on so many other shows, they never get the sort of instant feedback that we get for working on this. Like someone talked to me about an episode, I think I recorded three days ago <laughs> and it was, it's, I loved you on that. I was like, is that out? Like, I, I really, I was surprised. It was this uh, scene where uh, All Might is kind of having a conversation with Bakugo. It's like basically his only scene in uh, this season so far. Uh, and I just literally recorded that the other day. Yeah, I think it was insane. just, I mean, four days ago or something uh, like that. But see, I think that also speaks to this amazing aspect of anime as this culture because through the process of dubbing, it is so fast and readily available. And so as soon as it's done you know, in Japan, there is this pipeline to get it here so that there's not this disconnect between the fandoms. To, for you to see that technology change, that's gotta be something on par with the whole idea of the volume and stuff like that um, and how this process makes it easier, faster, more oh, accessible. Yeah. When we recorded Dragon Ball yeah. and Yu Hockey Show and stuff, we had to have these giant machines that would sit underneath this old computer where I finally was able to talk to my boss to get uh, 16 megabytes of oh RAM in our oh computer at the time. Uh, megabytes, guys. <laughs> uh, your phone has more power than that. I was like, can we please get, because this four megabyte RAM is not working for us. Can we please get 16? Like, oh, I don't know, that's pretty expensive. Uh, and it was back in those days, but it was just really slow going. We had this massive machine that played the video 
because they didn't digitize the videos at that time. They had them like literally synced to this old tape recorder and it would take just as long to rewind as it would take to actually play it in reverse because it was just super slow. It was it was an antiquated machine. Yeah. And for but now we can do you know, we can do 15 takes in a minute. It's like you can just loop it and loop it and loop it. I mean, most of the time most people don't need it, but it's really Still, it's cool technology to have. That's amazing. That's amazing. So Funimation as a studio space in the early days, would you equate that to kind of like old Hollywood, MGM, how they would bring in uh, a number of actors under their umbrella and then try to get as much work out of them as possible? That's a good description, yes. Except um, it's certain, well, I don't know what old MGM was like, but old Funimation was just, it was a rickety old weird place in a bank building. Like, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's old MGM, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the same cool, thing. cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically the same thing. That's we were wild. kind of almost like a theater company. And yeah. he, some kid came up to me today and he goes, how come you played like so many characters in Dragon Ball? I'm like, because at the time, Funimation was paying actors like $17 an hour. Right. Um, and it, anytime anyone got a slightly better job, they would just leave. And when I was directing, I didn't have a replacement for right. them. And we, because we only had 15 people on our cast list, and if, the, if someone else didn't know how to do the voice, said I did it. So yeah. I started only with Vegeta, Piccolo, and Yamcha, because right. I think they thought they could save some money. And then it became Vegeta, Piccolo, Yamcha, Mr. Popo, Kami, <laughs> all the dragons, Gaz, Piccolo Jr., like the dra like uh, Icarus, and uh, just a billion other characters. Right. Anytime a character, an actor would leave, I go, all right, I can do. I guess I have to so do it that's now. Me now. So. That's amazing. But no one ever knew that it would lead to anything like this. No one knew that there would be Funko Pops that you have to sign or something like that. Thank God for Funko these days. Hey, hey, no, we love them. We absolutely love them. Your vo voice training. Um, you studied opera and, and vocal work. Uh, University of North Texas, is that yep, correct? that's correct. So you already understood that you had a power with your voice. At what age did you realize this? Was this like a puberty thing where like you wake up one morning and you're like, Oh, oh yeah, dude. Oh my God. I woke Talk up one morning, when I was, it was between 6th and 7th grade, I was, I don't know, like 11 years old, and my voice dropped from like, you know, Justin Briner doing a, <laughs> doing a baby voice, the highest voice, like, I went from like Monica Rial's voice, uh, the highest, like, highest boy voice to my voice that I have now, yeah. like almost overnight, I don't know what happened. And I woke up like, oh, mom, something's weird. <laughs> I want to go to the doctor. <laughs> something's not right. And uh, so, like, you soon, like, I grew up in League City, Texas, it's south of Houston. And uh, apparently, there's a Netflix series right now that's talking about, like, called The Killing Fields or something. Oh, snap. Apparently, it's off Gulf Freeway on 45, very close to pretty much where I grew up. So, watch that, see the kind of place I live. Okay. Um, but I grew up in a small town in south of Texas, so when you had a voice that deep, everyone just kept saying like, man, you have a voice, you need to get into radio, you need to get into radio. And so I got into radio uh, eventually, and it wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be, gotcha. because at that, it's a long story, but at that time, radio used to be this really creative place where you could play your favorite records and you could talk over them and, and you were entertaining people, but by the time I got into it, it had been really corporatized, so you had to read these exact things that they would give you, and you had exact timing, and a lot of it was like on a satellite now, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what I did find is I loved doing production. I liked making commercials. I liked doing voices on those things. Of course. And that was sort of the start of my like voiceover career. That's sort of. amazing. See, this is one of those things where like you guys get the end result and you love it, but the journey is part of that thing that we don't get to talk about all the time or people don't ask you about all the time. So when you made that transition from not just doing radio, but to actually go, I can do acting with it. How did that transition happen? I didn't even think at the time, I didn't even think it was acting. I thought it was, I just was like, oh, I get to record my voice on stuff yeah. and make sound effects and make music for it. Cause when I was really little, I'm, do, I'm doing basically right now what I did when I was a little kid. Yeah. I used to collect anything that made sounds I would collect it and I'd put it in my room and I'd hoard it and then I would make recordings of just everything. I'd go to the library and I'd, and I'd rent sound effects records uh, or I'd check them out from the library and then they'd be six months overdue and then I'd forget to bring them back and I still have some of them to this day, sorry. Um, but I would love to like play, I would, I would find all these record players and play them at the same time yeah. to create these uh, environments long before I really knew That's what I was even doing. Um, 
And so that's what it felt like to be in it. And then I was going to school at UNT. Right. I had left the opera department actually because I realized, oh, this is not fun at all. Um, and I went into radio, fil television, film, and I was just literally in an astronomy class. Wow. Um, no, astrology. Okay. No, astronomy. <laughs> Thank you. I thought, wait, that's not the Taurus thing. Okay. <laughs> About stars. I was falling asleep in the class because it was really dark. Um, and I got a page from a friend of mine that I used to like hang out with, and she said, hey, you should, well, it said numbers, and then I had to call them back uh, from a payphone somewhere, and they said, you should come audition. I work for this little tiny company. We have four employees. You should come up and audition for the show. And I came up, auditioned for a little show. It turned out to be Dragon Ball. That's and that was the first role I ever had. Oh, my God. If not for that text message, or not text message, I'm sorry, page, children, uh, we wouldn't have you. For you really the, young kids yeah, yeah, out there, yeah. a pager yeah. was about the size of a, a small phone right. that you would clip onto yourself or put in your pocket, and it would vibrate or make a, like an annoying noise. A beep. And you'd have to look and see what numbers are on it, because you'd have to enter the numbers in. Uh, of what, like it, there was no text. So That's you right. just had, it just said basically, call me. And you had to call them. Well, you can't quite say there was no text. We got really clever using our, our beepers to come up with some words. That is true. That is true. <laughs> but, yeah, for yeah. the most part, it was just... Said it, and you always had to have quarters, okay? Because pay phones weren't free. Think about That's it. That's right. Um, okay, so if you don't mind, I'd love to open it up. We've got a few minutes to hear from some of your fans. Wow. <laughs> Slowly, <laughs> safely. Slowly, safely. Actually, at this point, I bet you that's more than enough questions. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I always yeah. feel bad for the people who wait too far back in line. They stand the whole time and Absolutely. then they don't get their questions answered. Uh, Hello, Frank. Hi. Hi. So I was wondering what the most emotional scene you've recorded so far is. Mm. Oh, there's a there's a good handful of them. Probably the show that makes me cry more than any other show is My Hero Academia. That show just makes me cry. It like I, I think it's actually because I had kids, and once you have a child, you grow this organ in your body that cries a lot more yeah, often. Yeah, yeah, makes yeah, you, yeah, like, it's true. I don't know what it is. Like yeah, no. you have this organ that like hurts when your kids get hurt, and you just feel a lot more emotional for some reason. Uh, it's where onions come from. That's, yeah. that's what makes you cry. It's that juice. So, um, yeah, man, it's like uh, let's see, you, the the entire United States of Smash. Uh, moment was amazing. I loved um, I loved this moment where All Might is talking to Midoriya's mom and trying to explain to Midoriya uh, To explain to her that he hasn't really done a good job of looking after Midoriya. That was really heart-wrenching um, There was a really dark scene last season where he was sitting on a park bench with Aizawa if you guys remember that scene that was that was heavy but there's just something about Recording with all the music in my ear, everything just sounds so beautiful. I tend to, like, I like sports guys, but I also cry a lot. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Cry. Yeah. Just do it. It's all cry right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, hey. <laughs> um, so my question is, what's the hardest thing about being a voice actor slash celebrity? whether that be in the industry or in your personal life. Also, how was the stress ball at uh, Monica? Monica had left, so I just threw the stress ball at whoever Ooh. came by. I know. Oh, wow. She gave me a stress ball today, so I was supposed to throw at Monica Real, but she had, she had escaped to go to the airport. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, any problems being a celebrity are really not problems. They're, they're just the most ridiculous problems, like, ugh. People I, love me. I can't eat breakfast at this one hotel because someone wants to say that they like me. That's a really tough thing to have on my shoulders. Oh, man. My life sucks. Um, the hardest thing about being a vo like an actor and a voice actor especially is, um, especially on like shows, shonen type anime and stuff like that, is it's really painful and it hurts a lot. Like The process of making Vegeta's voice just hurts by its very nature. Because the thing you're not supposed to do with your voice ever is to pinch off the back of your throat. Right. But in order to do a raspy voice, that's precisely what you have to do. So it's these, it just hurts really badly. The other thing that sucks is that 
and it, this is the same, I guess, in any job, but you really, it's very hard to deal with other life things when you're, in, when you're recording and vice versa. Like you can be dealing with some really difficult stuff and yet you've got to come in and just pretend to be like the happiest dude ever. Like you've got to come in and just do uh, really difficult, like you, you have to use different emotions than you're feeling. And so that you have to kind of shut off all the things that are happening in the rest of your world and then just turn on like the acting part. Exactly. And, it's, and there's a lot of acting involved there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. What's up, Vegeta shirt girl? <laughs> Did you have a question? Hi. Come on, you can do it. Hi, so my question is, what has been the most difficult project you've had to do making the voice of Vegeta? Uh, let's see. Pro uh, it was most of the stuff in Dragon Ball Z. Uh, the original version of it, not Kai, because in those days, you know, we were using that antiquated computer equipment. We didn't have the ability to stitch stuff together like we do now. Because now there's a, there is a way. There are some just impossibly long screams in Dragon Ball right. that no human could ever do. Uh, so we do have a method of like you scream up to a point, you go ah, and then you just kind of sing that note, and then you go ha. Go, uh, whatever, and then you can stitch all those together, and you can make it last forever, right? Oh my god. But back in the original days, it was like, ha! And then it would cut away, and you're like, yes, I'm done. And it cuts away, and then it comes back, and his mouth is still open. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> I gotta do it again. I used to tell new actors when they would come in to work on Dragon Ball, I'd be like, okay, there's two ways we can do this. You can either scream your butt off right off the bat, right? Do be the best, loudest, most insane scream you've got, or you have to do it two times because I'm not really going to want the second time anyway. So uh, just do it once. That's the best way. That's why. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Bye bye. That was a great yell, by the way. Like that was. I felt like the room was going to blow up when you did that. Like, Dude, that do you know? I heard my own ears earlier. They like. GalaxyCon has a mascot. I don't know if you've seen them around. Yeah. Uh, and they wanted me to take a picture with this helmet on. And it's like a glass space helmet, so, and it's big. But when I talk in there, it's the loudest sound I've ever heard. Yeah. It's like all of my sound is coming straight back at me. That's wild. Hello, hello again. Hello, hello. So my name's Myra. Hi, and Myra. Thank you for your time. Um, what beyond talent do you feel one needs to bookwork and keep working? Mm, that's a good, well-worded question. question. Yeah. Uh, you you need a lot of dedication. You have to follow through. You have to uh, you have to walk this fine line of being aggressive enough to get your foot in the door, but not annoying enough for them to kick you out. Um, you have to be likable and you have to be kind to people because people just don't want to work with jerks. You know what I mean? Um, so there's you, you also have to have some luck. You have to have a little bit of people. You have to have a ability to network subtly in a way, which in my opinion, networking is just basically getting to know people in your industry without ever asking them to do anything for them. You just get to know people. It's, it's really weird. Like I had um, one of my favorite games is Halo and stuff like that. And like, uh, and Civilization and some of those um, earlier uh, kind of world building games. I just went blank on it. Uh, anyway, I had a client that I'd known for, I mean, he worked in the, he worked at Ensemble Games and I'd known him for like 15 years. Yeah. Never, like I'd hung out with him a billion times, never once asked to ever do any work for them. And then finally, at one point he's like, hey man, I guess I've never asked you, do you guys want to record any of this stuff for us? And it was awesome. But you just had to be patient, um, and you really had to be extremely uh, versatile and like be, do as many things as you can. Don't just make, don't just aim for the center of the dartboard. Try and like make a dartboard as big as you can, you know? Nice. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Wise words, we love it. Hello, friend. Hello, my name is Aaron, and I'm a professional brewer. And um, one day I'm hoping to 
open my own brewery dedicated to all things nerd and geekdom. I like that and idea. I was wanting to ask you what types of beer would Yami and Vegeta <laughs> like to drink? <laughs> uh, so, oh wow, something very stout. Vegeta would drink it even if he didn't like it. Yeah, definitely. He's like, it's delicious. <laughs> I love it. It bur the burning lets you know it's working. Um, Yami would like the cheapest beer possible because he's like, I, I don't want to pay for it. So, uh, I don't know. I think uh, Yami would probably like a good ale and, and Vegeta would, uh, well, of course, he would want a blonde ale because that means he's gone Super Saiyan. Ooh. Thank you so much. Well played. Very welcome. Hello. You, you have to name one of your beers Super Saiyan Blonde Ale now. Yeah, so. yeah immediately. Hello. Hi. My question is, if you could, would you change any of the voices for your past or current roles? Oh, that's a great question. There have been many times when I wish that I hadn't done the voice that I did at the time. I'm like, oh, why have I done this to myself? Were you, and that is a bad thing when you can audition. Sometimes you'll audition for something and you'll use a voice. And then once, you, once you're in the session, you realize, oh, this was a bad idea. I'm trying to think, there was a character uh, that I took over from another actor in Dragon Ball, and he was uh, Ox King. And he was like, oh, GG, or whatever, something like that. And I, it was too difficult for me to do. And then when he showed up, but I, I managed to make it all the way through like Dragon Ball Z, because he didn't have much to do. But once we went back into Dragon Ball and he had to be this you know, aggressive character. I'm like, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, no way. So I passed it on to Kyle Hebert. Nice. But yeah, a lot of times I, I try not to, uh, I try not to obsess too much on what I would change about stuff. In fact, I'm really bad about going back and watching anything I do. Not because I don't like it. It's just, I get really, uh, I'm too judgmental, I guess, or I hear too many things. Mm. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Oh, hey. This mic. You can lift that up. I'm yeah, that was. Oh, that's perfect. All right. So you work with so many amazing, um, like actors, directors, producers. But there's one person I want to talk about in particular because I love his work a ton too. That's Justin Cook. Um, what is it like working with him? He just seems like he would be so fun to be with. It's funny you mention him because earlier when I was just talking about like my history at, at working and the kind of the stuff we did back right. in the early days. Justin Cook was my engineer at Funimation wow. for a while. And uh, I have, I have, I have fun, a very funny story about him. I was like, I got really mad at, well, not mad at him. I was just like, hey man, you can come any way you, to work you want to come. You, you can do, you can wear anything you want to wear. You can do anything you want to do. You just can't be late. That's it. And because unfortunately, you could stay late every single day and no one will remember, but everyone will remember when you're late. That's right. Uh, like you can stay late all you want, but when you come in late, it's just, it throws everything off. Uh, and he was never late again. Um, and then we have become, like we were the best of friends and still are really great friends. Uh, and all the way through, he, he finished, we finished Dragon Ball Z and then he started working on Yu Yu Hakusho and then I was cast as Kuwabara, and he was Yusuke Urameshi in Yu Yu Hakusho. And during that time, we were hanging out all the time. I ended up having an apartment, co uh, like I lived in an apartment really close to Funimation because I was working there like 120 hours a week. I just was nonstop there, and so was Justin. And we would just go to work. He would come over to my uh, apartment, and then we would just play like The Sims until I would fall asleep, and then I'd wake up in the morning, and he would still be there because he'd never slept, and he'd be still playing The Sims. Um, and he's just an outstanding guy. One of the things about Justin that is remarkable too, and a lot of people don't know this about him, is that he's very obsessive about and very perfectionist about the stuff he does, and it's kind of evident in his work with. Fruits Basket was just a nearly perfect dub. Yu Hakusho was a nearly perfect dub. He was just so good at the stuff that he touched. And he's the kind of guy that, if I introduce him to something, I'm like, hey, check out this. Have you ever listened to much Miles Davis? And I go, not really, actually. And I'll introduce him you to Miles Davis. Yeah. And then next time, like about a year later, he'll go, 
Oh yeah, I've, I've been listening to Miles Davis a lot. I have every single album he's ever made in the first edition of it, and I have them, like, he's a collector as well. Awesome. And his house is just like a museum of stuff. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. So, timing-wise, we, we're gonna try to get through as many of these as possible, so we need to do, excuse me, really quick questions. They just have to be one-word yeah. questions. There we go. Yes or no's. No, they have to just be one word questions. Oh, one word questions. Not one word answers. Do answer. and you're done. <laughs> what? It's like, Hi, my name is Enzo. Hi, Enzo. Oh, uh, my job. It's not broken, just pass it along. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering what it would be the most funny slash interesting show or well, anime that you voice acted to uh, have a crossover with another anime that you voice acted in. Oh, wow. Uh, the weirdest two shows I've ever worked on is a show called Ninja Slayer. Mm -hmm. Has anyone seen Ninja Slayer? Mm -hmm. Bizarre yeah. show. And then my favorite show, probably one of my favorite shows I've ever worked on, I'm still working on to this day, is called Pop Team Epic. Woo! Show's amazing if you haven't seen it. It's really bizarre, but it's really, really amazing. I would I would cross those two shows together and then it would just explode because it just make, it would make absolutely no sense. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He must be famous. He had a camera. Man. He does. <laughs> he must be more famous because the famous guy is filming him now. I, I know, right? <laughs> hey, friend, how are we doing today? Uh, doing pretty well. How are you guys doing today? Oh, just great. Uh, that's great. So, I know you are very well known for a lot of your roles where you happen to be. Buff blonde men who think with their fists. <laughs> so, was it like voicing characters who sometimes may be the exact opposite, like say Arthur Watson Ruby? Mm. That's a good. That is a. That's a, a very good question. I was telling someone earlier that for some reason I always get cast as characters, and my voice, for whatever reason, works really well for characters who pretend like they don't really want to be in the group. Mm -hmm but they really have a heart of gold or something like that. They, like, they're rough on the outside, but they're really actually very nice. Like, they're good people inside. Uh, it's weird playing Arthur Watts, for instance, because he's just evil through and through. Like, he's just completely evil. And I've barely gotten to know that character, and it seems like he might, have, he might be dead already, but oh, who wow. knows. Uh, but he was, a, he was a really thrilling character to play. I would have a, I've told people before, I could never play I could never play like Goku. I could never play that character. Partially because I just don't like the character. And I think he's terrible. He's literally just like, he's the hero of the show only because he has a head injury. That's it. Well, also true, also true. Vegeta had to earn it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would have a very difficult time playing like, tr like really, really, really pure characters because I just am not, I'm not good at those. But you are that good of an actor. Come on, give yourself. I don't know, man. I had to, I had to audition once for this kids show. This before I had kids, and it had the most hokey dialogue I've ever heard. It was just like, "Hey, kids, you like to like come join us for some super yummy blueberry pancakes?" No, no, that's and it, after I left the audition, it was in person. I felt like Ugh, I need to roll around in dirt yeah. for a while. <laughs> I didn't like it. I'm way too sarcastic for that. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank good you. Question. Thank you. I, I love the monologue in Ruby from Watts. That's why I was asking. Yeah, he was, he was amazing. Thank you. Hello. Hello, me. <laughs> um, so, out of all the projects you've worked on, video games, cartoons, who did you geek out the most when you got to work with someone? Oh, man. Uh, it's personal. Wow. Good job. Well, I'm here for Good it. job. <laughs> um, oh, wow, there's so many, like, so many moments. Uh, shoot, I... There's one I can't even talk about right now uh, that I was on. It was a prelay show that was like insane. Uh, God, come on. There's so like I, I need to think about that. I think I'm I'm trying to come up with the best example of one, and it would be because I'm trying to think. Of, I I've worked on a few recently that I am so excited to eventually be able to talk about. Um, Follow him on social media. After yeah, I know. If it's a dumb, you you waited all this time to ask a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, to talk to you in Philadelphia, so I'm home here. I know. I t like you followed me all the way here, which no, is weird. Actually, I like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You're still wearing the same Vegeta costume. 
Uh, oh gosh. Um, I, I, there, there was one time, there, there was actually one time I was in the studio at the same time as like Don LaFontaine, oh, wow. the guy who did all the movie trailer voices. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I always wanted to like, I always thought that was the coolest sounding thing in the world. And so I asked him, I'm like, hey, if I want to be a trailer voice guy someday, what do I want to do? And he gave me like literally the worst advice of all time. <laughs> Probably advice I would never give to somebody, or maybe I would, but he was like, well, you just need to smoke as many cigarettes. Wow. And wow. <laughs> Drink as much whiskey as you yeah. can. And I'm like, all right. And I tried. Um, <laughs> Kill the guy who has the job. Turns out it's, it's, um, doesn't help that much. No, it just no, makes you no. really tired and scratchy. Sorry, that took so long. No worries. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to say, like, the Vegeta family, like, is my favorite family in all of Dragon Ball. So my question is, um, what is your favorite like family moment or Vegeta and Bulma? Mm. Moment? Two moments. When he when uh, he finally defends his wife. When Bo uh, Beerus slaps her, yeah. the My Bulma moment, best moment, and then when he finally takes Trunks to the park, that was pretty fun too. Yeah, that, that, I asked Monica and Alexis the same thing, and that that was Monica's. Well, both of them, yeah, it was the park. Awesome. And yeah. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Okay, so listen. Wait. I'm sorry. Yeah. We have to get to the All Might person. Oh, I have I'm no sorry. idea that. I just like want to let you know that. Even if she just comes up here and I look at her, that's all I can done, done, like. done. Just give you guys a heads up. If we have to cut it off, everyone else that's in line, you're going to get first dibs to be in the stage selfie. So we'll bring you guys right up here. So just to make up for you not getting to ask your question, we will get you here. So go for it. Um, hi. My question is, what was your favorite season to voice act in My Hero? Probably the first one because he was in it the most. Right. <laughs> I, I love that part. Um, all of it. For season one and two were great, and then they, you know, all Mike got tired and they stopped using him for a while. So I'm hoping that they do something interesting with him, but don't kill him. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Great Thank questions. you. Hello. 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 Hi. I just want to say right quick, it's an honor to, to be uh, asking this question right now because uh, you voice acted my top three favorite animes, which is uh, Attack on Titan and Yu Hakusho One Piece. But this is a Yu Hakusho related question. Uh, what is uh, the most challenging thing, like, you know, voice acting Cool Bar and Rising like, that you had to face? Mm. Oh, most people, a lot of people don't even know I was Use Case Father Ryzen. Um, that kind of came up unexpectedly. Uh, Kubara was just a weird voice to do. Like, I talked to people, I'm like, Kubara's voice would never be done today. There's no way. If I did an audition like that, they go, no. no, mm -hmm. no. Next. They're like, that's dumb. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but what's weird is, like, we all liked it. The people liked it. It was very endearing for whatever reason. And it, it really worked for that show. Um, Ryzen was fun because I just got to kind of use my deep voice and got to do fun stuff. I don't know. There, it, the... The challenge was understanding what the heck was going on in the show sometimes because when you play certain characters, especially when you play like a sidekick character that's not always in the show, very hard to know what's yep. going on. Yep. Like My Hero Academia, I don't have a clue what's going on right now. <laughs> All I know is that uh, the, I think if you ask me what season six is about, it's uh, uh, All Might is sitting in a gymnasium. Okay, yeah, like, that's, that's it. Right. That's, that's right. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And by the way, yeah, Cool Bar definitely carries the show. Yeah, I just want to say that. Oh, okay. thank you, brother. Awesome. All right, look at you. <laughs> you are here. I am. Hi, um, first of all, I love you. Um, and, and this is just a Christmas theme, right? It is, yeah. I love I, it. I jingle bells. Oh, I love it. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. So I was just wondering, you know, we know a lot about All Might, but as far as Toshino Yagi, I feel like we don't have much information on him and what he likes and things, so I was just wondering if you had any personal headcanons about Toshinori. That's a good, that's, yeah. I was just talking to someone about this earlier, like that is a, that is an area of this show that really should be explored someday. Like I think they could do an entire OVA or a massive, like a lot of flashbacks, like a season long flashback about that. <laughs> because that's the one thing I, I've been always like wanting to know. I mean, when they had that, uh, the only little glimpses we've gotten to his past was in that one movie. Uh, what's it, uh, Heroes Rising? Heroes. No, what, what was that? Two Heroes. Two Heroes, thank you. 
had the double Detroit smash in it or whatever. That was amazing. Um, when he had his friend Dave or whatever, that uh, when he was like, his outfit was broken, it would go like, oops, and fall off. I was like, maybe they dated or something. I have no idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, we don't know a whole lot about his. We don't know a whole lot about his past. I would like to see what he was like and how he inherited that quirk too. It's a huge mystery of the universe. I do, I do have a headcanon that, that Midoriya's dad is just in the other room watching sports or something wow. and just doesn't care. Like he's just like, he's like, are you still in there talking to that stupid superhero dude you like? <laughs> Tell your mom to bring in another case of Red Bull or whatever. He's just like on the other side I don't of the wall. What a sandwich. That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> and on that note, I'm afraid we have to draw the line. But you guys get first dibs in the selfie, so you guys stay right where you are. You guys line up over here and get in front here. Chris, thank you so, so very thank much. Thank you very much, guys. Make some noise, guys, to Con Columbus. Chris, we're going to have you line up over here. Come on over here. Now's the